I was enjoying a peaceful life, content with a stable job that paid well. My world was turned upside down one day when my credit card company called to inform me about a suspicious $50,000 charge on my account. I was utterly taken aback by this news. I acted swiftly to stop the charge, and in the aftermath, my husband, who was then overseas, bombarded me with phone calls. With some effort, we managed to clear up the confusion. My name is Alexis. I'm seven years old, and I've climbed the career ladder to become a manager. My journey began in college where I met Paul, my husband, who is of the same age. This year marks our third wedding anniversary. Many of my acquaintances chose to leave their jobs upon getting married, but I had compelling reasons to continue working despite societal norms. I am the primary breadwinner in our household, earning more than my husband. This fact is an unspoken element of our marriage, yet it looms large in my mind. I often ponder our financial stability, concerned that relying solely on my husband's earnings might not secure the future we envision. Nonetheless, it's clear he shares these concerns, even if we seldom discuss them directly. Financial independence is key. We maintain separate finances, equally splitting household expenses a system that affords me the freedom to manage my discretionary income as I see fit. This arrangement has fostered a sense of satisfaction and has contributed significantly to our comfortable lifestyle. However, there are moments that prompt me to reconsider our expenses. One such instance occurred while I was reviewing my email notifications on the train home. Frowning upon seeing a debit alert, it served as a reminder to reevaluate my ongoing subscriptions, contemplating the necessity of each. Yet the task of managing these financial obligations often falls by the wayside, complicated by forgotten passwords and the daunting prospect of navigating customer service hotlines. The restricted availability of these services, confined to standard working hours, does little to ease the situation creating a paradox for working individuals like myself who find it nearly impossible to reach out during these times. Despite these hurdles, I find solace in the small pleasures of life, like online shopping. It serves as a brief escape from the pressure of work, with the arrival of each parcel bringing a fleeting moment of joy. Yet these moments of happiness are quickly overshadowed by the realization of the need to manage my finances more prudently. The comfort of returning home always brings a sense of relief, a reminder of the stable life we've built together. Despite the occasional financial folly, when I walked into the living room, I immediately felt annoyed. Socks were scattered on the floor, empty cans were on the table, and there were a phone and a sweatshirt on the sofa. Yes, this was my husband's doing. He tends to leave a mess everywhere after he gets home. I couldn't help but complain about the socks and cans. He just shrugged it off, saying it was easy to clean up, and I could just do it if I was home early. Why couldn't he help clean or make dinner? He complained about being tired and having to eat convenience store food. I was tired too, but I argued that if he wasn't going to help around the house, he should at least focus on his work. He didn't take my frustrations seriously at first, but I could tell he was annoyed when he repeated his dismissal. He left the room, glued to his phone and ignoring my glare. It felt unfair that I was doing more work in housekeeping, yet I wondered if I'd have been too harsh. I worried he might become even more careless just to spite me. Surprisingly, my words seemed to have an effect. He started coming home late, claiming he had overtime work. It seemed like he was trying to change. I was so pleased that I began to put even more effort into the housework, thinking I should support him since he was busy. One day, I came home early and decided to tidy up his room, which he hadn't cleaned in a while. It was a mess, just as I expected, with empty cans and bottles everywhere. I was about to throw them out when I noticed something unusual on the bed, a gift-wrapped package. 
I couldn't clearly make out what it was at first, so I decided to shine a light on the mysterious object. It turned out to be a bag from my favorite brand, beautifully wrapped and just sitting there, partially hidden. The realization hit me, could this be a surprise birthday present? My birthday was just around the corner, the following week to be exact. A flicker of excitement passed through me, but I quickly suppressed it, choosing to act as if I hadn't seen the package. I wanted to keep the surprise intact, assuming my husband had planned to give it to me on my special day. However, my much-anticipated birthday came and went without any mention of the package. I couldn't help but bring up the subject, half in jest, half in hope, asking my husband if he remembered what day it was. His reaction was one of brief surprise, followed by an awkward acknowledgement of my birthday. But when I prodded him about a celebration or a gift, his response was dismissive, almost as if gifting was an obligation fulfilled in the past and not to be bothered with again, especially now that I was old enough. His words stung more than I cared to admit, and he retreated to his room, leaving me in a mix of confusion and disappointment. The situation took an even more peculiar turn when out of the blue. My husband announced he was scheduled for an overseas business trip the following week. This was unprecedented. His job had never required travel before, let alone an international trip. He attributed this sudden opportunity to his recent good performance at work. Under normal circumstances, I would have been supportive, even happy for him. However, the unexplained birthday gift and his nonchalant dismissal of my birthday had planted seeds of doubt in my mind. On the morning of his supposed departure, I watched him leave, my heart heavy with a mix of emotions. Once he was gone, I couldn't resist the urge to investigate further. I ventured into his room, a place I hadn't stepped into since the day I discovered the hidden gift. My heart raced as I looked under the bed where the gift had been, only to find nothing. The absence of the package confirmed my suspicions. There was more to the story than he was letting on. This wasn't about a business trip. It was something else entirely. Dragging myself to work that day felt like moving through molasses. My thoughts were elsewhere, caught in a loop of doubts, fears, and unspoken questions about my husband's actions and intentions. I struggled to concentrate, my work suffering as a result. My colleagues noticed my distraction, inquiring if everything was okay. I brushed off their concern with a weak excuse about lack of sleep, not willing to share the turmoil swirling inside me. Amidst this inner chaos, my phone vibrated with an incoming call from an unknown number. Normally, I would ignore such calls, but given the day's earlier revelations and my heightened state of anxiety, I felt compelled to answer. Maybe it was intuition or perhaps desperation for any piece of information that could shed light on the situation. I picked up the phone, my heart pounding in anticipation of what or who awaited on the other end. I had to step out for a bit and press the button to answer my phone in the hallway. It was the credit card company calling. I started worrying it wasn't my husband calling. I realized I would have to share my password and other details. I wondered what they wanted, and the person on the phone quickly explained they were calling because my account showed more than $20,000 spent. Actually, $50,000. I couldn't believe it and panicked, thinking there was no way that was right. I hurried back to my desk to check my wallet, but it was missing along with a credit card that should have been inside. I got back on the phone and asked if I could stop the transaction. Luckily, it was still pending, so they said I could stop it. I felt a bit better, but knew this wasn't the end of it. I told them I didn't have my card and asked them to treat it as if it were stolen. The person agreed to start the process right away. Even after hanging up, my heart wouldn't calm down. I told my boss I was feeling sick, that my credit card might have been stolen and misused, and I needed to leave early to sort things out. 
My colleagues and boss were concerned and let me go home. Rushing to catch the train, I saw my husband had called me many times, almost as if he had something to do with this mess. I got home, tossed my bag aside, and went straight to my husband's room. I opened his computer to check his search history and saw luxury cruises and travel packages for couples at the top. I wasn't supposed to know about any trip. I checked the destination and realized this was the business trip he mentioned. It was clear it wasn't a business trip at all. I looked through my emails and found it. A booking confirmation with the name Mario on it. Who is this woman? I was so angry I nearly broke the keyboard. But I forced myself to look for more proof. My phone kept ringing, driving me crazy. I remembered the password the credit card company gave me, so I logged in to check my spending history. As I looked through it, my shock grew. There was a charge I didn't recognize for a fancy bag. Everything clicked. Paul had used my card to buy something for his mistress and even took her on what he claimed was a business trip. Frustrated and angry, I finally answered my constantly ringing phone. My husband was on the other end, complaining about the card not working. I confronted him about Anne, and he stumbled over his words, claiming he didn't steal the card, but borrowed it for convenience on his business trip. I questioned him about the so-called business trip and mentioned the luxury cruise. He tried to dodge the question, but I pressed on about Anne and the bag. He tried to act confused, but I laid out everything I knew. The cruise, the couple's travel package, the $50,000 spending, and the payments to Anne using my card. Hearing all this, my husband could only repeat, I understand, as if finally realizing the gravity of the situation. After he admitted to cheating and awkwardly apologized over the phone, pleading for me to reactivate the credit card so he could return home, I felt a mix of anger and disbelief. His assumption that a simple apology would erase his betrayal was absurd. I sharply told him to enjoy his indefinite stay at the resort, effectively ending our relationship with that phone call. Ignoring his attempts to continue the conversation, I hung up. His persistent calls soon followed, each ringtone amplifying my frustration, until I decided to block his number, seeking some peace from the incessant buzzing. Knowing his return flight was scheduled for noon in three days, as per the booking confirmation email he never intended for me to see, I sprang into action. These three days would be pivotal. My first task was daunting but necessary. I began the process of removing all my belongings from our shared home, severing the physical ties that bound us. The following day, armed with divorce papers and his computer, which contained undeniable evidence of his infidelity, I visited his parents. The revelation of their son's actions left them both furious and deeply apologetic. Their immediate response was supportive. They assured me of a swift divorce, a generous alimony of $145,000, and reimbursement for the expenses their son had wastefully incurred. As the day of his supposed return arrived, I received confirmation from his parents that the divorce papers were processed. They shared that apart from the illicit credit card expenditures, he had not taken any money. The other woman, having learned of the entire fiasco, was enraged. In a fit of anger, she changed her ticket to leave for Singapore before him, leaving him stranded. It puzzled me why she hadn't taken more drastic measures, like taking his passport, to further complicate his return. When he finally arrived back in Singapore, he was greeted by the stark reality of an empty home and a disconnected phone number, mine. In desperation, he sought solace at his parents' house, only to be met with severe reprimand. They insisted he sign the divorce papers, officially ending our marriage. Complicating matters further, the woman now demanded from him a repayment of the $50,000 she presumably felt entitled to given their affair and its lavish expenditures. 
His parents once again had to cover this amount, but with the stipulation that he repay them in full. Until then, his lifestyle was significantly curtailed, much like that of a strictly supervised teenager, complete with a 9 o'clock p.m. curfew. In the aftermath, armed with the necessary details from his parents, I pursued legal action against the woman for $7,000, seeking some form of restitution for the role she played in this ordeal. With that final act, I concluded this tumultuous chapter of my life, ready to move forward, free from the deceit and betrayal that had ensnared me. The next day, I went back to work. A lot of my coworkers, both my seniors and juniors, showed they cared about me. They asked, hey, are you okay? I'm here to listen if you need to talk. It made me feel thankful to work with such kind people. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Let's grab a drink sometime, my treat. It'll be like a venting session, I suggested. They agreed, and it felt good to let out everything that happened while we shared some drinks. It was like I was washing away all the bad memories. I ended the night feeling hopeful, thinking that from now on, only good things would come my way. Yes, that's right, I told myself, feeling optimistic about the future.